Namaste. So dreams are very much discounted in Western culture. We are taught from, oh, about the age of five or seven that, you know, dreams are for kids, dreams are for babies. Don't you want to grow up and be real, you know? It's only in your mind. It's only a dream, people will say. But yet, dreams are an incredible wellspring of strength for those who nurture and cultivate them. They can become a tremendous source of creativity. All the innovations that benefit human beings were the product of dreams. Somebody had a dream and they brought it into reality. And isn't that what an artist does? Take their dreams and make them real, so-called real, <laughs> in the real world. The gross physical world is the object of Jagrat consciousness. But the mind and thoughts and dreams are the objects of Svapna consciousness. Now, Svapna is dreams, but it can also mean imagination. For example, Einstein came up with his theories through imagination, through what he called Gedanken experimenten, mental experiments, thought experiments. So in the same way, we can perform elaborate worship on a grand scale of whatever, whoever is our Ishta Devata, our favorite form of the Godhead, Brahman. And we can do these pujas in our imagination. And this is called Manasa Puja. Manasa Puja is mentioned mainly in the Puranas. And we can find in the Puranas detailed explanations of extremely complex and elaborate and opulent worship of various deities, Vedic gods. And so uh, these also occur in the Upanishads. But in the Upanishads, the difference is the rituals are presented as Manasa Puja from the very beginning. In other words, nobody uh, who is a student of the Upanishads, who is living in the forest, who is a renunciant, who is, uh, you know, completely without any material resources, is going to be able to afford, let alone, you know, actually produce a great Vedic sacrifice. I'm thinking of the Ashvamedha Jagna. Ashvamedha, or the horse sacrifice, is like the greatest Vedic sacrifice. It can only be performed by the emperor of the whole world. And <laughs> it requires what would be today several billion dollars worth of offerings in a grand scheme, including an, you know, a, like a stadium where <laughs> thousands of people come and watch. I mean, it was far out, Ashvamedha. But the result that it bestows is identity with Hiranyagarbha, identity with Brahman. So, you know, Lord Brahma is the creator and he knows everything and he is the reservoir of all living beings, especially their false egos. <laughs> but also the bodily forms. He is the ancestor. He is the progenitor. He is the one who populates the universe through his sons, grandsons, etc. And so, you know, he knows everything. He knows everyone. He is also death. And he is also 
consciousness of the external senses and so on. So this Ashva made a sacrifice is incredibly, incredibly powerful. But, you know, unless you happen to be in those specific circumstances, uh, you know, you're the emperor of the world, <laughs> the unchallenged emperor of the world. See, before they do the sacrifice, they let go the horse uh, at, the, at the capital of the king who's going to perform the sacrifice. And the horse can go anywhere it wants. It's not herded. It's not directed. It goes by its own free will. And if it wanders into a neighboring kingdom and that king wants to challenge the suzerainty of the emperor, the would-be emperor, all he has to do is capture the horse and then send word, of course. So then they arrange a duel on a battlefield, which does not involve collateral damage, does not involve the citizens at all. They duke it out and may the best man win. So this goes on until the challenge horse returns without being captured, without being detained uh, by any challengers. Only then can the sacrifice move forward. So, you know, unless, <laughs> unless you're like, you know, super wealthy, you don't even have a prayer of performing this. Unless you imagine yourself as the emperor of the world and you imagine that you have a staff of brahmanas capable of performing such a sacrifice and you imagine that you have all the gold and other wealth necessary to do it properly according to the Vedic injunctions and you imagine the whole thing taking place you know, you imagine a stadium full of people, everything, in all details. Well, then, the Upanishads say that you will get the result of performing the Ashvamedha sacrifice. In other words, you will be able to merge with Hiranyagarbha. You will be able to identify with Lord Brahma and then with Brahman, because Brahma enters into Brahman at the end of his life, at the end of the creation. So he's a Jivan Mukta. Wouldn't you like to merge with a Jivan Mukta? <laughs> Especially a powerful one like Lord Brahma. So the role of imagination in performing Manasapuja the mental worship of the Lord in any form is also declared in the fourth chapter of Vedanta Sutra, Brahma Sutra, uh, as being valid because any meditation on any form or aspect of the Supreme God is deemed valid by the Vedas. Any form of worship, of any deity, as long as it is conceived to represent or be a form of Brahman, the absolute, the highest deity, that worship is valid and it gives results. So therefore, this is why I tell people, you know, if you are out of money, you want to worship, you want to do sadhana, you want to retire from the material world, but, you know, cash flow is a problem. <laughs> you know, if money is a problem, it means you need to do karma yoga. Why? Because in karma yoga, you worship a deity, such as the Shiva Lingam here, in terms of the Vedic injunctions, and one of the results of this is prosperity, wealth. So once you have sufficient wealth, then you can perform sadhana without any break or without any problems, without ever having to deal with outsiders or anything, if you have sufficient wealth, sufficient autonomy. So 
if you knew how to perform this puja, this mental puja, you can do much more, a much more elaborate and beautiful sacrifice, a, a much grander and more elaborate puja than you could ever do, you know, materially. I have very bare bones set up here, you know. Uh, but to do the puja properly, as it's described in the Puranas, well, that's a tall order. But see, why are they described? Well, two reasons. One is so that the forms are not lost and the mantras and the procedures and so on are not forgotten. Even if someone is unable to perform them. And then there's a second reason. They can read and imagine performing them and get the same result. Manasa puja. Manasa yagna the performance of mental sacrifices, grand, elaborate ceremonies invoking a particular deity, whether it's Vishnu or Shiva or Devi or, you know, whoever you want to worship, whatever form of God you want to imagine. Huh? Even if you uh, want to attain Brahman, at some point you have to imagine Brahman and having some kind of relationship or some kind of dealings with Brahman. I mean, the Upanishads say that the realized being revels in Brahman. Brahman is his constant companion, his friend. See? So they have a relationship. There's a relationship between the part and the whole, between the drop and the ocean between the individual and Brahman. So, of course, yes, this is Saguna Brahman, but still, you know, <laughs> Brahman is Brahman. Beginningless, changeless, inconceivable, inexplicable, unpredictable, <laughs> wild, huh? a force of nature. Oh, no, a force beyond nature. Uh, nature is Brahman's force, right? Mother Nature, and we all know how unpredictable and whimsical she can be. That's all right. That's her nature, you know. He likes them wild like that. <laughs> because they're a challenge, right? So anyway, we should imagine, we should dream our relationship with Brahman, both Saguna and Nirguna, it's all right. How are we going to, for example, meditate on nothingness, on emptiness, unless we imagine it first, unless we create a simulation, unless we mock it up in some kind of our mental space and think of how it would be if we actually experienced it. I mean, that's certainly the, the way forward or the way to approach that actual experience of emptiness is through a mental simulation or a mental imagination of it. Nothing wrong with dreams. In fact, dreams are the portal that leads to complete enlightenment. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.